perfect. Okay. Okay. Hi everyone, good to see you all. Hi Madan. Hi Hannah. There's a few familiar faces here, which is great. Thanks for all the uh, the support and for uh, giving up your Monday nights and not watching England versus Germany. Oh, wow. <laughs> you guys are more important than England versus Germany. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Rob's here as well, so let me just pin Rob. Okay, brilliant. So um, we're going to crack on. Um, we are recording this to see. I've got a list of things to say here. Make sure I behave myself. Um, so we are going to record this tonight. So um, if anybody doesn't particularly want to be shown in a recording, um, then um, just keep your cameras off and you shouldn't come up on the recording at the end. Okay, that's the first thing to say. What we're going to do is a Q&A at the end of the session. So we're going to use the chat group as a, as a way to um, essentially gather all the different questions. And then what we're going to do as a panel at the end is I will run through the questions and feed them to, to Johnny, Kevin, uh, Dave, Rob, and myself. Uh, although most of them will be going to, to, uh, to Kevin and to Johnny um, <laughs> around lumps and bumps. Uh, but that's the way we're going to try and do it. Okay, so if you've got a question that comes to mind during the talk, pop it in the chat and we're going to try and see if we can handle as many of them as efficiently as we can uh, at the end of the session. We've got Johnny till uh, nine o'clock, which is amazing. Um, so we're going to try and get through as much as we can um, by then. Um, if you can keep your cameras off during the session, that's ideal. I'm still trying to get used to using Zoom. And if you put your camera on, then sometimes you pop up onto the recording. <laughs> Um, so hopefully I've worked a way around that, but if, that, if you can do that, that'd be great. Um, otherwise, I think we're probably um, ready to go. We've got 63 now in the room, which is amazing. So um, I think everyone knows me. I'm Stu, um, involved with the ultrasound site, do various courses, love my ultrasound. Rob and Dave are also with me this evening, very much as part of, of the group of us who are trying to push... Um, push MSK ultrasound, trying to push open access to education uh, and to, to try and develop these areas as much as we can. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted tonight to invite, uh, to, invite to introduce um, Kevin and Johnny. Um, both needed no um, arm twisting or, um, or bribes to, to come on and to support what we're trying to do with this. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted. So thank you to both of you uh, for your time, expertise, um, and, and enthusiasm on a, on a Monday evening um, as well. Um, do you guys want to just introduce yourselves and then we'll hand over to Kevin to perhaps sort of start the slideshow? Sure. Uh, go ahead, Johnny, if you want. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Johnny Walker. Um, I'm an Australian uh, interventional radiologist with special interest in uh, MSK and, uh, and oncology. Um, uh, trained in Australia, trained over at the UK at the Hammersmith and up at Cambridge, and um, just love my ultrasound. Went back and uh, did a lot of uh, ultrasound in remote Western Australia, and then we set up a little practice, um, a teleradiology practice around the world called Global Diagnostics. And throughout that time, we, we launched with ultrasound, and uh, I've never stopped um, being clinically active. And Kevin, I've had the pleasure of working with alongside, we ride shotgun with me when we do our MSK sessions at Hermitage, which has been a real treat. Um, so my name is Kevin Cronin. Uh, I'm a lecturer in University College Dublin. I'm a radiographer, stenographer. Um, I have a keen interest in musculoskeletal ultrasound. I'm the programme director on the MSC ultrasound in University College Dublin, Ireland. And uh, I'm a PhD candidate where I'm assessing um, the muscle architecture or injuries in uh, professional rugby union players. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Um, so what we'll do is I'm going to sort of unpin a few of us now. Um, and hopefully we can then. Um, Kevin, do you want to share your screen at this point? Sure. This is where this is where it all goes wrong, isn't it? <laughs> Okay. Can you see that? Yeah, so I've got yes, yeah, so I've got both Brilliant. of you and the and the uh, and the slide deck, which is perfect. Um, so, guys, during just for the other guys who are listening in, if you can keep yourselves on mute and keep your cameras off during Kevin's talk, so that we can hear Johnny and Kevin really clearly, uh, that's fab. And for those who just joined, any questions at the end, if you can stick them in the the chat group, then what we'll do at the end is we'll run through those and try and answer them. But I'm going to stop talking and hand over to you, Kevin. Great. 
Okay, so I think what we'll do is we'll jump straight in because we have a lot of material really to get through uh, in the next hour. Uh, we've already done our introduction. The lecture outline for today is uh, first we're going to speak uh, briefly about the clinic evaluation. Kevin, sorry, sorry me yeah. again. Do you mind just going to slideshow rather than sl the um, preview slide? Sure. Yeah. I think that'll yeah. look a bit better if that's possible. Okay, sorry about that. How's that? Uh, it's just coming through. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, it's a bit bigger. That's brilliant. Okay. Lovely. So, Thanks, mate. No problem. So the lecture outline is clinical evaluation, clinical presentation, ultrasound appearances, and patient management of lumps and bumps. Let's first talk about clinic evaluation. So I'll just do a quick uh, brief of clinic evaluation, and then really Johnny's just going to take over here. Before we ever decide to uh, sonographically evaluate a lump and bump, there's a series of questions we should always ask the patient. And the reason why is before we ever pop that ultrasound transducer on the patient, we have uh, our top three differentials um, that we really think is what we're looking at. So the very first question we should always ask the patient is lesion duration. So how long has that lump or bump been in situ? Uh, is it there for a couple of months or has it been something that's popped up in the last couple of weeks? If it's something that's, uh, now generally, if it's something that's been sitting there for quite a while in the absence of any symptoms, the research would tell us that it's most likely to be benign. Ask the patient about the lump and bumps growth pattern, if it's fast growing or slow growing. Uh, if it's something that is fast growing, that's when we should be somewhat uh, concerned about the lump or bump itself. You should always ask the patient as well, uh, when did you notice the lump? Was it incidental, perhaps maybe when you were in the shower, or did it jump on after some form of a activity? Uh, ask the patient itself, is it painful? Physically, uh, get pop on a pair of gloves and uh, palpate that lump or bump. And also remember, we have an ultrasound transducer in our hand. It doesn't just take images, so apply some uh, palpation, sonopalpation, and ask the patient, how does that, uh, how did it respond to that sonopalpation itself? Uh, when you're palpating the lump itself, what we want to see is, is it mobile or fixed? Is it firm or soft? And certain lumps and bumps are either mobile or they're fixed or they're firm or they're soft. Look at the surrounding areas on the skin. Are there any associated skin changes? Are there any systemic uh, symptoms themselves? So for example, if the patient presents with a lump or bump, typically maybe at the groin, and they have an associated fever, you're thinking maybe some form of an abscess. Ask the patient themselves, does the lumper bump uh, impact on their range of movement? Does it impact on the joint itself? Does it impact on daily activity? Because that might have implications on the surgical outcome or uh, if there is going to be some form of a surgical uh, procedure. Always check your previous imaging, and that's really, really important, or access to previous uh, radiology reports, whether they're x-rays, whether they're MRIs, um, CTs, or previous ultrasound imaging, because they will always uh, give you some form of a clue of what's going on. So, Johnny, if you just want to jump in there, maybe on um, anything and add anything to that. No, I agree, Kevin. I think just remember that the patient's your friend. And you've got them there. And um, uh, always, always take a history, full and thorough history. And um, before you even pick up the probe, do the physical examination. Use your hands to feel um, whether it's um, soft, whether it's fluctuant, pulsatile, is it is it warm, um, tender, is it mobile or fixed? So all of those things you've said, Kev, but just remember the patient's your friend. They're usually pretty good historians, and particularly in terms of the duration of the lesion. And also think in terms of where is the lesion and what's the most likely cause of this set of signs and symptoms in a patient of this age and sex before you even pick up the probe and as you say you know the probe is um you've got a pr probe get using it it's going to um it's going to open it all up for us great so the ultrasound report uh briefly we're first going to, firstly going to introduce you to what should really go into an ultrasound report now if you identify a lesion and you've never seen a lesion like this before or a lump and bump and there are some clues that uh, we can give you just to help. We will touch on a full ultrasound report at the end of this talk. Um, but typically, this is something that I would tell some of the students at university. You should always have SSO, TMO in the background. So if we apply this to every lump and bump, what kind of things can we start talking about? So the first S stands for size. Is it large? Is it small? If it's a follow-up scan, is it enlarging? Is it increasing? Has it reduced in size? Has it decreased? 
The next S stands for the shape. So look at the overall shape of that lump and bump on your resultant ultrasound image or sonogram. Is it rounded? Is it ovoid? Is it linear, globular, fuzzy form? But also, has it got a mass effect? And that's quite important because if it has a massive a mass effect, it means that there will be some associated symptoms with this lump or bump. And most likely, and not always, but if it has a mass effect, that's typically what we see with uh, malignant uh, bumps themselves. Again, how does this uh, apply when you apply sonopalpation? Does the overall contour, the shape of this lump or bump itself, does it change? Looking at O, O stands for outline. So looking at the outline, is it smooth? Is it irregular? Is it disrupted? If it's a cystic structure, look at the walls. Is it thick walled? Is it thin walled? When we apply Doppler, is there an increase in Doppler activity on the periphery? Um, and also look at um, some of the artifacts that surround it. Is there edge artifacts? So typically, but not always, benign substances themselves have a smooth outline, whereas if it's malignant, it's quite irregular and it's ill-defined. Look at the overall texture of it. So when we speak about texture, we're looking at the echogenicity and the echotexture. When we say echogenicity and echotexture, how does the echogenicity and echotexture look within this lump and bump to the surrounding structures, so the surrounding soft tissue structures? So when we speak about echogenicity, is it hyperechoic? Is it hypoechoic? Is it isoechoic? Uh, look at the internal structure, the architecture of this lump of bump itself. Is it homogenous? Is it heterogeneous? When you apply color, is it avascular? Is there an increase in vascularity? Typically, most benign lesions are typically avascular, but if there is some form of vascularity within, it's somewhat malignant. And also look at artifacts themselves. Artifacts give us secondary, uh, like secondary findings. You have posterior acoustic enhancement and posterior acoustic shadowing. So posterior acoustic enhancement is an area of brightness that we see deep to it. And we typically see this with uh, cystic structures. And if there is a uh, posterior acoustic shadowing, you'll see an area that is darker deep to it. M stands for measurement. So when we're looking at a uh, measurement, a, stop, uh, a lump or bump, uh, typically it's two in trans and one in long. So what we want to see is uh, another little hint is when we're looking at a lump or bump, we should always try to identify the distance from uh, the skin surface itself. Because when you read the research, what it tells you is deeper structures, not always, but deeper structures typically tend to be malignant. O stands for origin. And origin means you really need just to know where it is and know your anatomy. And gone are the days when we annotate our images and say in just region of interest. We really need to learn our anatomy and we need to use the buzzwords. So in relation to, is it proximal, is it distal, is it medial, lateral, anterior, posterior, deep, superficial? And if you're unsure, always compare it to the contralateral side. Now I'm going to jump into a series of lumps and bumps throughout. And what I'll speak about is the clinical presentation, the sonographic appearances, a very brief introduction to patient management, and then Johnny's just going to take over as an MSK consultant radiologist as to we've looked at the sonographic appearances of the lump and bump. What next happens? What next with this lump and bump? The very first lump that we're going to identify is a lipoma. A lipoma, the clinical presentation associated with it is it is a benign tumor composed of fatty tissue cells. It is localized and non-tender. It is soft and non-mobile. And there's two types of lipomas that we generally see. They're either subcutaneous or intramuscular. Where do these typically happen? Well, they typically occur on the trunk, so maybe the, um, the abdominal trunk, limbs, or even on the neck. They're only symptomatic if they're fast growing and if the local anatomical structures are somewhat compressed, such as local nerves and so neural substances themselves. If you have a look at the images on the right hand side of your screen while I call these out, these are the typical sonographic appearances of a lipoma. They're typically well encapsulated, oval shaped structures. The echogenicity is somewhat varied. Typically more um, fresher or new lipomas themselves appear somewhat more echogenic and older and more mature lipomas themselves appear somewhat more hypoechoic. And when we say echogenic or hypoechoic to what? to their surrounding tissue surfaces themselves. Um, if you look at the internal structure of the lipoma itself, 
what you can see is you can see these fine curvilinear white lines. And these are wavy echogenic internal linear striations. And a top little tip that I would give all you sonographers yourselves is if you apply some pressure on these, sometimes they um, just straighten up in a line. So um, if you apply no pressure, you can see that they're curvilinear. And with applied pressure with your transducer, sometimes they typically just align up in a straight line. Sometimes what you see with these lipomas themselves are posterior acoustic enhancements or an area of brightness. And sometimes, but not always, they are avascular. So what happens if you do see a lipoma? Well, if the size hasn't really changed in size recently, typically um, some clinicians don't really do much with them. So the general rule is anything greater than five centimeters in a lipoma, uh, anything less than five centimeters in a lipoma, and with no sinister features and no symptoms, it's just a case of let it be. Now, if you take an ultrasound image and you're unsure of what you've actually seen, you should always refer for an MRI or if it has grossly enlarged in size or if the ultrasound features are inconclusive. So Johnny, in, when I'm describing those ultrasound appearances of the lipoma as an MSK radiologist, is there anything else you'd like to add to that? Oh, Johnny, I think you're on uh, your mute, mate. Here, Johnny. God, how many times am I told that a day? But um, <laughs> this and Kevin, thanks for that. And look, if it's lovely when we get the beautiful pictures like you've presented here, Kevin, but you know they can be devils, can't they? Mm -hmm. And um, particularly the unencapsulated uh, lipoma, which really is um, camouflaging in with the remaining uh, subcutaneous tissue. And then look for all your secondary signs there, as you, as you say, the posterior acoustic enhancement. But usually you can almost see a, a, a ground glass type pattern in the subcutaneous tissues for those non-encapsulated um, lipomas. So just beware of them. Um, and again, you will have felt and palpated and try to identify and localize the lesion. Just also look for any signs of um, where the lipoma is is beginning to insinuate um, along fascial planes and also around perivascular and neurovascular bundles, et cetera. Anywhere where it's just looking like it's misbehaving and showing more aggressive features, then the um, the red flag should go up, okay? Because we worry about um, transformation into things like liposarc. Perfect, Sarcone. great, thank you. So next up is a ganglion cyst. So what is a ganglion cyst? Well, the clinical presentations of a ganglion cyst are their benign cystic masses. Now, they're most commonly seen at the wrist, approximately 88%, and they also present at the ankle joint themselves. Those that present at the wrist, uh, at the wrist uh, they're common at the scaphoid lunate region, uh, the uh, radio scaphoid joint, and also we see peripoly cysts themselves. When you get your hands dirty, they're firm and they're typically non-mobile, but they can fluctuate in size. Typically, they are associated with the older population themselves. And like a lipoma, the symptoms are only when they are compressing surrounding anatomical structures themselves, such as nerves. Look at the ultrasound image on the right hand side of your screen. The sonographic appearances of a ganglion cyst are, they are anechoic cystic masses. And because they're fluid filled, they will have posterior acoustic enhancement. Typically, they are thin walled and they're well circumscribed. They're typically rounded and lobulated. And when you apply a uh, Doppler, uh, they're typically avascular. Now you should always try to identify the stalk. So there are proliferation from the joint itself. So you need to try to identify where that um, stream flowing into the ganglion cyst, what joint it's really uh, coming from itself. Patient management itself is sometimes typically if in the absence of symptoms, it's let it be. Um, and still, if you don't know what you're actually looking at on that resultant image itself, the um, RCR guidelines would identify that uh, most likely you should be referring these patients for an MRI after that. Uh, treatment varies obviously between sites and even within countries themselves. And because we are in Ireland and uh, some we were somewhat similar to things in UK, but some, sometimes they quite differ. Uh, the treatment options for ganglion cysts themselves that sometimes uh, outside of let it be it would be an aspiration with a steroid injection uh, and a surgical excision which is sometimes the gold standard because if you aspirate it and pop in some steroid it's, it most likely will come back uh, they were typically in the past as johnny well knows they're called bible cysts and smacking it with a bible is just a no-no so johnny do you want to add anything to ganglion cysts um kev just that um 
Uh, it's great to see the comma sign, so um, the stalk uh, going down, particularly to the uh, triscaphoid articulation. Um, they can be multiceptated, particularly if they've been there long, um, they've been aspirated, and they can become quite complex. And But they're, they're still just think common things occur commonly, and it may be an unusual appearance of a very common process. Um, although last um, Thursday, when we were on the call, mate, I got a, um, a rip-roaring uh, tenosynovitis, which was an acute on chronic, and it was it was at a pseudo mass. But when I felt it, I thought this is going to be a ganglion cyst, and I was wrong. So always always think about what are the other structures mm -hmm. in and around that vicinity that can actually produce a mass like um, pattern. Great. Um, next up is a peripoly ganglion cyst, not too different from a ganglion cyst. Um, so what is a peripoly ganglion cyst? Again, it's a benign uh, cystic mass, and it typically occurs uh, at the A1 or A2 pulleys. Um, it's typically a firm and non-mobile mass. On, typically, you can feel on the palmar aspect of your hand. It can fluctuate in size. The symptoms with these are on finger flexion and uh, grasp and activity. So patients, if they're in older population, they might often say that it's quite painful when I'm holding a bag or my groceries or uh, stuff like that. Uh, local anatomical structures, again, are compressed, and that's when we have symptoms associated with the peripoly ganglion cysts themselves. Sonographic appearances of ganglion cysts, as you can see on your, the middle uh, image here, above the flexor tendon sitting on top of the joint, is there are anechoic cystic masses. Again, they're thin-walled, well-circumscribed. Because they are a uh, fluid-filled structure, you should have posterior acoustic enhancement. But because where they're sitting, uh, it is quite difficult to identify the posterior acoustic enhancement because it's quite diff difficult to identify that with the tendon sitting underneath it. They're typically rounded or lobulated, uh, avascular. And uh, again, you should try to identify the stalk to see what joint, but because there's so many anatomical features uh, at that location itself, it can be somewhat difficult to identify. Patient management is like a ganglion cyst. Again, uh, in the absence of any symptoms, let it be. If you're sitting on the fence um, and it's symptomatic, the patient might be referred for an MRI. And the treatment, again, is the exact same. Aspiration, maybe with a steroid injection in acute management, but it won't uh, get rid of the problem, or surgical uh, excision with a portion resection of the tendon sheet itself, and that's gold standard itself. Uh, Johnny, would you like to add anything to peripoly ganglion cysts? Kev, uh, just to say that I tend to use a standoff um, for these, particularly if there's any um, equivocation, um, but they really are and aren't many. Uh, you know, they, they, they're a classical pattern um, and they, they just look like aren't many um, but, and the beautiful thing about ultrasound over MRI for instance and I love MRI but with ultrasound don't forget use the dynamic both passive and active um, flexion and extension and see what the ganglion cyst does particularly relative to the um, uh, to the pulley system. And that's so true on Johnny what he was saying with the standoff if you have a look at the middle image we can see we're scanning at a depth of uh, 0.5 or 0.25 to identify the uh, peripoly ganglion cyst so you won't see this if you apply any pressure or if you don't do a standoff. Next up is an epidermal inclusional cyst so also known as a sebaceous cyst uh, present as a superficial uh, sometimes it can be tender or not a firm lump typically they're slow growing typically are located on the scalp, on the neck or in the face. Uh, sometimes you can have them on the trunk or else on the back. Now, they can rupture and mimic an aggressive lesion. Um, sometimes patients often try to pop them themselves. They're a benign, fatty, um, sebaceous tissue themselves. Uh, often you might see, uh, looking in from the outside before you apply any ultrasound gel, is a visible central uh, penunctum. Sonographically, what do they look like? Focus on the sonograms. They're ovoid, they're uh, well-defined, they're well-encapsulated, and they have a, they're typically a hypoechoic mass, but sometimes they can be hyperechoic relative to the surrounding tissue itself. Sometimes you can have scattered internal echoes within, and these are typically sometimes more hypoechoic. What we see here is there is usually always posterior acoustic and enhancement, and more often than not, they are avascular. The patient management with these is, uh, again, in the absence of symptoms, if it's not causing any symptoms, if it's slow growing, uh, if it hasn't changed in size, leave it be. Um, if you're sitting on the fence again, RCR guidelines would say uh, MRI. Treatment is temporary. You can inject a steroid into it uh, to reduce the swelling of the, and the pain if it's, a, if it's symptomatic. 
Um, but uh, to have a definitive diagnosis is typically in incision and removal itself. Johnny, is there anything you'd like to add on sebaceous cysts? Oh, Kevin, that's all good and they're great examples of it. It's nice when you get multiple. Um, and of course, if you do get multiple, always think, um, could these be a differential of um, neurofemoropatosis? Great. Next up is a foreign body. Okay, so what is a foreign body? Well, a foreign body is something that's not supposed to be there. Uh, typically, the patient's clinical presentation still have some form of a history of a trauma or an activity. So if it's a trauma, uh, think in your car crashes or an alteration within um, a pub. If it's an activity, it's sometimes most likely foreign bodies present in hikers. So wood splinters is a common one. There generally are localized pain. Sometimes when you're getting down and looking at the uh, wound site, uh, you might always see the entry site itself, and that will allow you to do a targeted uh, ultrasound examination. You'll have some form of redness at the uh, wound site. Uh, wood and glass embed easily into the subcutaneous tissue and muscle, but they don't embed well into the tendons themselves. Um, old foreign bodies um, that are sitting there for quite a while will have a reduced range of movement and they'll form some form of a granuloma tissue on, on the periphery itself. Again, um, I, I know in Ireland when a lot of patients present with foreign bodies because it's an on-call situation, there won't be access to an ultrasound scanner or an ultrasound uh, service. So a lot of these patients actually go for uh, x-ray initially, which is quite poor at identifying uh, foreign bodies themselves. So always check your previous imaging if it's available to you to allow a more kind of um, a targeted ultrasound examination. What are the sonographic appearances? So focus on the ultrasound images. Uh, typically they're a hyper echoic, so they're an echogenic linear structure itself. Uh, sometimes they can be curvy linear if it's a wood splinter. You'll see some enhancement uh, deep to it. So you'll see some uh, reverberation artifacts. And so if you look at the very top image on the right hand side of your screen, you'll see a reverberation artifact. And that's uh, typically seen in patients um, who have embedded glass in the hand. And that's because of the differences in the acoustic impedance itself. If you look closely at the foreign body itself, zoom right in, what you'll see is there is this hypoechoic halo on the periphery. And that is just edema. If you apply your color Doppler, what you see is some form of inflammatory changes on the periphery. So that's just an inflammatory response. The two most common types of foreign bodies that you will see in your clinic are wood and glass. Glass is more echogenic than wood. Wood is quite difficult to identify. So you're really relying on your secondary signs, such as your hypochoic halo, your increase in vascularity. Is there some form of an artifact at that specific site itself? Remember again, as Johnny alluded to in the previous um, lump and bump, you should be using a gel standoff for these kind of things. You're scanning really superficial and um, patient management, typically uh, like not always, uh, if, it's, uh, in, if it's inconclusive, patients will, might be referred on for an X-ray, um, sometimes MRI, but not always for a foreign body unless it's um, obscure in an uh, anatomical location. Treatment, the objective is always to remove it. So that's why you need to have a good annotations on your resultant sonograms to identify where this is. Um, you want to limit infection and you want to restore normal function. Deep foreign bodies themselves and uh, the appropriate surgeon, if a foreign body is associated with the anatomical, such as nerves, veins, tendons, etc., that's why they really want to get it out of there. Uh, superficial foreign bodies are typically treated in the emergency department themselves. Johnny, is there anything you'd like to add on foreign bodies? Yeah, Kev, um, just, it depends on your relationship with your ED physicians and also your surgeons. Um, surgeons hate going in and looking for foreign bodies. And, they, and again, these little guys can be devils. If you do see a um, linear a foreign body, we um, usually have the mandate to go on then and uh, remove. And what I do, a little trick that an old boss of mine taught me, um, I'll infiltrate uh, along the line of entry of the foreign body with um, local anesthetic, which opens up the um, the tissue planes and you almost float the foreign body out, um, not out of its tract, but um, away from um, the subcutaneous tissues. And then I just go in with a micro um, forcep along the line of um, entry and try and grab the end of the needle and then very gently 
very gently, just ease it out, ideally in one, one piece. If you can't, um, mark the skin so that the surgeons at least know um, the, the entry point and the alignment of the, uh, the, um, the lesion in uh, at least two dimensions. Yeah, great. Thanks, Johnny. Okay, moving on. So another form of a lump and bump that might present to your clinic is a lymph node. A lymph node is a focal or multifocal swelling. They're typically sometimes slightly mobile. They're firm. They can be tender and painful. And sometimes they're associated with uh, some symptoms such as a bacterial or viral infection themselves, or if the patient themselves is somewhat run down. Common locations are typically at the neck, the axilla, and at the groin. Have a look at the results in sonographic um, sonograms on the right hand side. The sonographic appearances of a lymph node are typically they are oval or round. They're well defined. They are usually a hypoechoic mass and they've got an echogenic linear hilum within the middle. These are normal ultrasound appearances. When you pop on color Doppler, the hilum itself will typically light up. So we will see hilar vascularity. Sometimes what you might see is you might see a hyperechoic halo on the periphery of the, um, the lymph node itself. And typically, as a general rule of thumb, is if they are less than two centimeters, they are normal. So what is the treatment of it itself is um, generally if um, ultrasound is, is used to confirm, is it a lymph node or not? Um, if um, you don't get a definitive diagnosis, the next um, image and port of call is MRI if ultrasound features are inconclusive. Generally, um, we'll say lymph nodes, they, they die down after a while. If they're unresolved, the patient themselves should be referred um, to a GP if the lump or bump is still present for uh, two to three weeks. If it still doesn't uh, die down itself, it's generally onto ENT referrals. Johnny, is there anything you'd like to add about lymph nodes? Yeah, Kevin, just that, that fatty hilum really is your friend. And um, the moment you start losing that kidney uh, bean uh, shape that you've beautifully uh, demonstrated there, um, little flags should go up. Um, as soon as it becomes globular um, and loses that fatty hilum, that raises it in to a, a more suspicious uh, process. It should still be reactive. Um, but, uh, and if it's particularly if it's hard, then that's concerning. And particularly if there are multiple of them in a cluster. Mm -hmm. Just remember in the axilla and uh, particularly in the inguinal stations, um, the nodes can um, can be enlarged um, on the, you know, we used to use the 10 centimeter short axis um, protocol, but they can be much larger and still completely normal in the axilla and the, um, the inguinal regions. Great. And that's where it moves us on to this. Okay, so where we lose the echogenic hilum itself. So in a lymphadenopathy, when we uh, go from um, a normal lymph node having an echogenic hilum, you can see here is when they're grossly inflamed, they move into a more rounded uh, mass themselves. We lose that echogenic hilum itself. Apply your color Doppler. You'll see an increase in vascularity. You'll see looking on the periphery of it itself, the cortex tenon itself, and typically uh, these inflamed lymph nodes, they're greater than two centimeters themselves. So the treatment is it should be immediately, if you identify that on your ultrasound, uh, you should be referring them on to a the general practitioner or to an ENT referral. Uh, Johnny, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I agree. Again, it, it depends on your relationship with the referral base, but uh, if I've got the patient on the table and you've got the team um, and it looks <coughs> nasty, I'll go ahead and do an NFNA with a true cut biopsy there and then. Great. Okay, so moving on to our next uh, lump or bump that you might see present uh, to your ultrasound suite is an abscess. So abscesses in clinical presentation can be acute or subacute. Uh, they're soft local swellings. Uh, they're associated with pain and swelling at the region of interest, skin changes. And you, what you might also see is secondary findings on the resultant sonogram itself is you might see uh, associated cellulitis, lymph node enlargement, uh, systemic signs of sepsis, asking a patient, uh, have they any uh, rigors, have they any fever, um, and they also might have um, laboratory tests such as raised inflammatory markers themselves. The most common uh, for MSK clinicians for an abscess is either is subcutaneous, uh, sometimes you might see them present at the groin. Uh, if they present at the groin, you should be thinking about the patient, what kind of category of it. Are they uh, in, um, intravenous drug abusers or um, are they injecting something there? Um, uh, look for maybe signs of previous foreign bodies, but sometimes uh, that can manifest on into an abscess itself. 
look at the sonograms on the right hand side of your screen. At the top, we have B mode, and then we've got um, uh, Doppler activity in the middle, and we have increased nodal activity on the bottom. So the sonographic clearances of abscess is they are irregular hypoechoic collections themselves. Now, on uh, dynamic scanning or live scanning, what you can actually see sometimes is echogenic debris internally within these, and that's perlent material. Um, if you apply your Doppler activity, abscesses are avascular internally, but what you'll see is on the periphery, uh, peripheral outside of it, you'll see a vascularity, and that's just a hyperemia response. If you apply sonopalpation, the patient won't like it, okay? Uh, you will, what you'll see is a response to it, okay? The patient might jump and say, that's where my pain is. Um, you might also see in the resultant sonogram when you apply that pressure, you're not also seeing what, how the patient actually responds to it, but you want to see what's happening internally within this lump or bump itself. And what you might see is a movement of the internal material and pain. If we've got associated cellulitis in the near field, what you see is that cobblestone appearance. The patient management, so if ultrasound is inconclusive, well, typically what they might do is they might refer the patient on for an MRI. So you can kind of see a trend here. If ultrasound is inconclusive, and we'll touch on this with some of the research at the very end, if ultrasound is inconclusive, it's generally moved into the next category of MRI with caution. Treatment is immediately, uh, if you see this in your uh, MSK clinic, it might be an immediately to the GP referral. If it's within a hospital or if it's at home or somewhere like that, it's typically get them into the uh, emergency department. It might differ. Johnny might identify what they might do if they see this in the radiology situation. But a uh, surgical referral is typically for abscess drainage with antibiotics themselves. So Johnny, is there anything you'd like to add to an abscess? Yeah, again, that's great, Kev. Um, just say, look, we classically see these with the, um, uh, the female breastfeeding with the mastitis don't we? And we get this sort of a diffuse inflammation with the overlying cellulitis, but it actually can form walled off or ill-defined um, abscesses and the, um, put a needle and aspirate, obviously within a uh, dedicated breast clinic, and the relief is just almost instantaneous. So in the same elsewhere in the body. Yeah, great. Okay, moving on to an osseous um, bump that you might see or lump is an osteophyte. Remember, osteophytes don't just occur at the calcaneum. Okay, so they can occur at other parts within the body. The clinical presentation is pain. Uh, typically, the patients will say they have a restricted normal range of movement itself. Uh, it, it can be quite difficult to palpate these lumps because they're deep. They're coming off the bone, so it can be quite deep to palpate these. Uh, typically, the patients uh, will often say that they have some form of a stiffness uh, with their surrounding uh, muscle architecture or tendons as a result of this uh, osteophyte itself. Why? Because it reduces the overall structural integrity of the surrounding anatomical structures, such as the tendon or ligament itself. At the very top right hand side of your screen, what we can see here in longitudinal orientation is your classic uh, calcaneal spur. Um, in the bottom right hand side of the image, what we see is a longitudinal uh, section or sagittal section of a uh, medial knee and what we can see uh, coming off the cortical outlines of the femur and the tibia is these proliferations and their osteophytes themselves. So sonographic appearances of osteophytes themselves are there is a disruption to the normal cortical outline um, or the normal bone alignment itself. It's generally what we see is an echogenic uh, focal uh, protuberance, so a lifting, so a plus lesion coming off the bone itself. What we sometimes also see is a continuity of the hypochoric halo, and that's just the cartilage or the periosteum. So if this was a fracture, what you might actually see is there might be actually a break uh, in the cartilage or the periosteum itself. Sometimes, but not always, there's um, an effusion associated with these um, osteophytes. But if you look at the ultrasound image of the osteophyte itself, can you see that the posterior acoustic uh, shadowing is more enhanced uh, on, the, um, on the osteophyte itself? And to me, as a stenographer, that's kind of the first clue that this is most likely um, an osteophyte. Um, general patient management itself is if ultrasound is inconclusive, the patient is referred, should be referred for a X-ray. And if that is inconclusive itself, the patient sometimes might go on and have an MRI. The typical treatment is for pain relief initially, maybe a GP referral. Typically, some of the research would say that we, before any surgery is ever done, um, it's in the hands of a physiotherapist. I'm not a physiotherapist, um, but it's in the hands of a physiotherapist. 
surgical referral then, uh, steroid injections, cortisone injections, or even osteophyte removal. Johnny, is there anything you'd add, like to add if you saw an osteophyte coming in through your doors? Yeah, Kevin, and, and in the same breath as osteophyte, you always think of enthesite as well. Mm -hmm. For instance, in the elbow, yeah, the common flexor and extensor origins, uh, you've got the olecranon spur at the triceps. Um, so, uh, and the beautiful thing again about ultrasound is the dynamic assessment. Okay, see if there's any um, interaction with the overlying um, bursa um, or uh, the adjacent tendons. Yeah, great. Okay, moving on quickly, it's, even though it is a um, not so much a lump, it's a bump, so a hill sax lesion. So the clinical presentation is from a traumatic event from anterior shoulder dislocations. Uh, typically, what we see is a, a, a focal defect to the cortical outline of the humerus. So that's well shown in the bottom right uh, side of your screen. Uh, it's common at recurrent anterior dislocation, so you should always be checking previous imaging uh, for this. It might be well picked up on a previous x-ray. The patient always presents with pain, a reduced range of movement. So when you're doing your assessment and you're looking at the cortical outline of the humeral head, see if there's any focal defect, so a minus lesion on the bone itself. Uh, it's a cortical depression on the posterior aspect of the humerus, typically where the infraspinatus tendon inserts and pain on son of palpation. Um, patient management uh, is typically, uh, if ultrasound identifies this uh, well intact and well good enough, um, if you're sitting on the fence, uh, typically the patient is referred for an x-ray, um, or if they've had an x-ray and had an ultrasound and they're still not happy enough with it, you're moving it into an MRI. Typically the treatment is uh, physiotherapy, uh, referral glenohumeral shoulder strengthening to prevent uh, the anterior dislocations happening again. Where anterior labral defects are large, or if there's a defect filling, which is quite rare, uh, typically the research would say that it's more a surgical procedure itself. They're quite rare. Um, Johnny, is there anything you'd like to add to this? Yeah, um, Kevin, always beware um, of the undisplaced um, greater tuberosity um, fracture, which can be actually quite common, even on the x-ray, uh, can be missed. Um, and ultrasound is fantastic just to look for those little comminutions and cortical breaches, even without the depression. But that's a beautiful hill sex. Yeah, and that moves us on to what Johnny was saying is Bankart's bony lesion. So again, uh, instead of the defect itself, again, clinical presentation, the exact same. But if you look at the resultant sonogram itself, is you might see a cortical disruption on the anterior inferior glenoid itself. Um, the glenoid itself might look somewhat abnormal. There is... Um, a loss in that normal cortical outline of the glenoid itself if you're applying pressure, son of palpation. Okay, there are some limitations with ultrasound at this period because it is somewhat quite deeper. Uh, if your ultrasound application system isn't very good, uh, you, you might miss these kind of ones. So what are you doing? You're dropping your depth, you're dropping your penetration. Patients that have high BMI can be somewhat difficult. So top tips there, uh, get down to the region of interest, focus at the region of interest, but using your highest frequency as possible. Uh, treatment again is uh, typically like the previous uh, physiotherapy referred and uh, more into ortho. Um, so I think we'll move on to the next one um, before, um, because I think Johnny has touched on that. Okay, so next up is one that we probably are all familiar with and we've probably all scanned at some period in our time is a Baker's cyst. So what is a Baker's cyst? Well, the clinical presentation of a Baker's cyst is it's a swelling or mass in the popliteal fossa. Uh, it's a reduced, typically patients present with some form of a reduced range of movement. The patient themselves might say that they feel some part of a pressure, a tightness or a, a stiffness on the posterior aspect of the uh, knee typically within the popliteal fossa. If there is pain, uh, always have a definitive in your head that is there some form of a uh, rupture. If the patient says that they have some form of an itching feeling in their calf, you're thinking rupture, so proliferation of the fluid down the, uh, the calf muscles themselves. Have a look at the ultrasound images on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, typically in the transverse orientation, what we always identify is that speech bubble um, appearance of it itself. Sonographic appearances, where is it located? In the posterior aspect of the knee and the medial head of the gastrocnemius and the semimembranosus muscle, which is one of the muscles of the hamstring muscles. It's typically an anechoic cystic mass. They are avascular. They will have a neck because it's a protuberance from the joint itself. Uh, if they're long-standing, somewhat uh, they might form septations or debris within. 
and always check the walls. So uh, if these are large, what I like to do sometimes is maybe split my screen and try to identify the most superior aspect and the most inferior aspect. And we really want to make sure that those walls are intact. If you're good um, with your uh, technical side of ultrasound, you should really be trying to do some form of a uh, panoramic or an extended field of view just to identify the full extent of the Baker cyst itself. Patient management, if it's asymptomatic, if it's incidental and small, let it, let it be, let it sit there, okay? Uh, if ultrasound appearances are inconclusive, if you don't know what you're looking at, the next line of imaging is typically an MRI. The treatment of Baker cyst itself, as I said, is typically a conservative treatment. Um, sometimes they might do a surgical um, excision, um, and that should be to treat the uh, intra-articular uh, cause additionally. Uh, but you should, the, the main objective should be to treat the intra-articular um, uh, reason for the Baker cyst. Sometimes what you might see is you might see an aspiration, um, a high recurrence uh, with aspirations themselves, and the patients might go on some form of antibiotics um, for Baker cyst. Johnny, is there anything you'd like to add to Baker cyst? No, uh, Kevin, just always look for the rupture, uh, but often we get them, don't we, depending on the length of our lists and the waiting list, but we might get them three, four days after the uh, the incident, and um, the fluid may well have dissipated with gravity down along the fascial planes of the soleus and um, both gastrocnemi. Um, I've got three on my list tomorrow for aspiration, and I'll always try and aspirate them to dryness and try and really get my needle along to the mouth of the neck. Okay, yeah, great. Okay, so also staying at the popliteal fossa, another lumpar bump that might present is a popliteal aneurysm, and they're quite important uh, lumpar bumps to know uh, if you identify them on the ultrasound scan and where to send them on to next. The clinical presentation, uh, the patient will often say that they have a swelling or a mass in the popliteal fossa, like a Baker cyst, they'll have reduced range of movement, the knee stiffness, the pressure, the tightness, the pain, but when you're palpating this, you'll feel some form of a pulsatile mass. And that's the clue straight away that this is potentially could be a popliteal aneurysm. Looking at the ultrasound images on the right hand side of your screen, what we see up at the top is B mode in the middle color and on the, uh, the bottom uh, spectral analysis. Location always arises within the popliteal artery uh, at the popliteal fossa. B mode is typically an anechoic focal dilation of the popliteal artery itself. And when you measure it, if it's the caliber of the uh, artery, the popliteal artery is greater than 1.5 centimeters, then it's called a popliteal aneurysm on ultrasound. If you pop on your color, it will be uh, vascular because it's within the popliteal artery itself. It will give that yin yang appearance or typically the Pepsi sign appearance. So looking at the middle uh, image there, it's typically the Pepsi sign, the swirling motion. Uh, spectral analysis will give us that uh, arterial waveform. So we really know that it's an artery we're sitting on. So, you know, if you only use B mode, you could mistake this for a Baker cyst. And we'll go through that on the last slide where we shouldn't be just using B mode. We should be using color. We should be using uh, Doppler. We should be using everything that's available to us. Uh, patient management, uh, typically if ultrasound features are inconclusive, next up is MRI. Uh, treatment for popliteal aneurysms is typically open repair or endovascular uh, aneurysm repair with stenting. So for Johnny, as a radiologist, is there anything you'd like to add on this? Yeah, Kev, just try your hardest to differentiate the um, popliteal artery from the adjacent vein. And um, sometimes it can be difficult. Uh, it, rarely you're going to get fox with a, a venous malformation or a fistula if there's been a history of um, trauma. Um, don't try and overly compress these things because they do have this atherosclerotic plaque, which can be quite... Um, uh, eggshell in it can sort of crack down. I've seen one ruptured um, and never ever biopsy these guys. Yeah, of course. Uh, next up is a paramenistal cyst. So staying on the knee, uh, clinical presentation is a focal swelling on the medial or lateral, so the inside or outside of the knee. Typically these patients present with some form of pain. So the ultrasound appearances with paramenistal cysts are typically there are anechoic or hypochoic lesions, uh, superficial, so sitting on top of the meniscus itself. When you apply your uh, color Doppler, they're typically avascular, they're cystic, and they might, depending on how long they've been sitting there, form septations within. What do septations look like? They're little web-like structures, echogenic areas itself. Now, a uh, rule of thumb, and this is something Johnny would have also said, to, uh, always said to me, is if you see a paramenistal cyst, look at the anterior horn of uh, the meniscus itself. 
and look for that little fissure, that little cleft, and that's its little tributary in the, into the paramenistal cyst itself. Patient management, uh, ultrasound is typically the best to identify these, um, or MRI. Uh, surgical um, treatments, so treatments, so the surgical excision of the cyst, the repair of the underlying meniscus tear. So it's not only treat the uh, cyst, but it's also to treat the uh, meniscal tear itself. If you aspirate it, there's a high recurrence rate. Uh, it's only really for temporary relief itself. Uh, Johnny, is there anything you'd like to add on paramenistal cysts? No, all good. Very, they're very, very common. Um, and if you do see, you've got uh, the beautiful alignment there of the midpole of that lateral meniscus, um, Kevin. But if you do see protrusion of the um, the midpole, for instance, the medial meniscus, by definition, as Stoller says, uh, you have an undersurface flap tear uh, until proven otherwise. Um, so, you know, you need that um, that flap tear to be getting the uh, the paramenisical um, cyst. They do recur. Um, I must say. And the orthopods are every MDT. I try. I say, guys, so you're going to do something about this, and um, they'll just inject me once, and I must say, I've had no pain since. Yeah. Okay. Minimal okay. invasion. So we're moving on to uh, hematomas. So the very first uh, lump or bump associated with hematomas is the subcutaneous hematoma. As it says on the tin, subcutaneous is just uh, underneath the skin. Uh, clinical presentation is usually from a traumatic event, uh, pain and tenderness. The patient will say that there's some form of a focal swelling. And if you just place your hand on top of it, you'll see that there's an increase in temperature on the skin. Now, hematomas themselves undergo somewhat of a um, a change in ultrasound appearances. In the very um, immediate or um, acute stage, Typically, you mightn't see any uh, accumulation of fluid, and it might just appear as an echogenic area uh, within the um, subcutaneous layer or even in the underlying muscle itself. But typically, by the time they get to the ultrasound department, and we call this uh, the acute phase, they're typically well-defined anechoic cystic masses. They're typically avascular. They have surrounding superficial edema, pain on some of palpation to the patient themselves. And you should always check the underlying or the surrounding muscle architecture to see if there's any form of a strain. If it's a subcutaneous lipo or hematoma and it's chronic, well, it's well-defined margin um, on its walls. It's typically hypochoic, but you'll see more uh, septations within it. And typically, if you apply uh, Doppler, it's a peripheral uh, hyperemia. So you see a hyperemia response on the outside of it itself. Uh, ultrasound features, if they're inconclusive, well, you know, the next uh, imaging is typically an MRI, but uh, they're, they're typically easy enough uh, lumps or bumps to pick up and you should really know, uh, taking a good history from the patient, what you're looking at. Treatment is typically a conservative treatment itself with a good uh, rehab program, or you can aspirate them depending on the size. I'll move on to the next one, Johnny, and then you can no, in because we're looking at intramuscular hematomas. So intramuscular meaning it's within the muscle itself. Again, it's usually a traumatic event. And typically uh, with intramuscular hematomas, it's typically a direct or indirect uh, trauma. So if it's a direct trauma, it's typically if it's sporting uh, injury, it's direct meaning the patient has taken a tackle. So typically you might see these in rugby players or if it was on an activity during the day, it might be a car crash or something like that. If it's indirect and it's in a sporting person and it's a intramuscular hematoma, you're taking some form of a, a running injury and typically these um, would present in maybe medial gastrocnemius tears, your tennis legs, or even a tear within the hamstring muscle itself or quadriceps muscle. Uh, ultrasound appearances, if you look at the images on the right hand side of your screen, uh, as per subcutaneous home, uh, hematoma, it's typically either acute or chronic, depending on the time, but it's an anechoic cystic mass. But you should always be looking for the vascular uh, disturbance. You should always try to identify is the myotendinous junction involved, is the aponeurosis, the little tendon place within the muscle itself, because uh, that correlates to the patient's return to play time or else uh, the athlete's return to play time. How quick can they actually get back to normal daily uh, routine activities? And the classification system that I routinely use is the British Muscle Injury Classification because I feel it's the most detailed. Uh, patient management, again, is typically uh, we say a good rehab program. Uh, they want to get the patient back uh, doing some form of exercise or loading, and it might be some form of an aspiration. Johnny, is there anything you'd like to add on hematomas? No, that's great, Kip. Just always look for the fascial breach. 
okay so that um and we're not getting any herniation again use your dynamic assessment as you can and remember that these can um, down the track many many years down the track turn into a myositis ossific hands yeah. you get this um ossific not calcific but ossific mass lesion yeah perfect okay subcutaneous fat fracture not so common but you might see it uh, how do patients present so they're usually from a traumatic event itself okay uh, because it's subcutaneous, uh, it's in the subcutaneous layer again, and the fat layer itself, so there's a fat fracture, uh, pain and tenderness, a focal swelling, again, warm, and the patient might have some form of a restricted range of movement at that site, depending on where it is. So typically, where might you see some forms of these are um, if it's just typically like a, a direct blow to the leg, or else even in a car crash where the seatbelt pushes in on um, the subcutaneous layers in the uh, upper thorax. Uh, sonographic appearances themselves are typically location, subcutaneous glare, they're ill-defined, they're heterogeneous, hypochoic, avascular, pain on sonopalpation, superficial, uh, muscle architecture deep to it is not disturbed, and if large, it can manifest into a subcutaneous uh, hematoma. So really, you need to take a good uh, clinical history from the patient, know your anatomy, know your layers and the resultant sonogram itself, um, and, uh, just to come to a definitive diagnosis itself. If ultrasound is inconclusive, the patients are typically referred for an MRI. Uh, treatment, again, is typically, uh, let it be, uh, conservative treatment and a good rehab program. Uh, Johnny, is there anything you'd like to add on these fat fractures? No, that's that's great, Kevin. We see this more often than you think, don't we? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you've got to think of it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, fat necrosis uh, is the next up. Uh, so again, clinical presentation. So this is more kind of an, um, a firm mass effect in the uh, in the fat layer within the, uh, just underneath the skin, so the layer. there. Uh, it's pain, there's previous surgery or trauma, a firm, small mass. The sonographic appearances, if you look at it, uh, is they're typically a hyperechoic, so a bright echogenic mass surrounded, ill-defined by a, a hyperechoic halo, and typically they are a vascular itself. Um, typically, the uh, patient management uh, itself is uh, ultrasound features are inconclusive, uh, so we would refer on to a MRI. And um, sorry, I don't know why that's popping up there, uh, but treatment anyway is uh, with pain and excision. Uh, sorry, is that popping up for you guys as well, the fat necrosis? That's all right, mate. Okay. Okay. Uh, great. Okay, let's move on to a sarcoma. Uh, so these are the ones really, as clinicians, we really need to be aware of. Uh, so uh, clinical uh, presentation um, of uh, sarcomas themselves are they are fast growing uh, focal masses. Uh, they are painful on the patient themselves. They impact the range of movement and the typical motto that we should always uh, use when we're looking at a lump and bump is malignant until proven otherwise. The ultrasound appearances or sarcomas themselves are they are typically a hypoechoic mass. They're ill-defined. They're invading. Uh, they have disorganized uh, chaotic vascularity. They have pain on sonopalpation. And what you might see sometimes with these are there might be calcification and there might be some form of posterior acoustic enhancement. When we look at it on vascularity, it's chaotic. It looks like that wagon wheel effect. These are uh, you, these are uh, big masses, and they're ones that we should never try to uh, just brush over. Uh, pain management with these are typically, if ultrasound features are inconclusive, typically the patient is referred for an MRI. Treatment of sarcomas, okay, is typically tumor removal and the surrounding tissue, radiation, and chemotherapy. So, Johnny, as a consultant radiologist, do you want to come in on the sarcomas? Yeah, Kevin, these are the ones we just can't miss. We can't miss. And the most important hallmark here is they are usually firm, hard masses, even if there's a component of lipo to the lipomyosarcoma. Um, they can look chaotic. Um, just to have your red flag up, I don't ever use the word malignant, but I'd say this is an aggressive pr process until proven otherwise. It still allows for um, aggressive inflammation, aggressive um, infection, uh, but it's nasty until proven otherwise. In terms of MRI, ours will... Um, uh, always go on to MRI with pre and post GAD. Yeah, definitely. Okay, uh, moving off the scary sarcomas um, into something not so scary is cellulitis. We're nearly there now, guys, okay? Uh, cellulitis, again, clinical presentation, skin redness, warmth underneath the skin, painful, itchy blisters, 
oedematous, um, um, we'll say limb or a region of interest. The sonographic appearances, what does it actually look like? Well, it's subcutaneous, so it's a tissue thickening. It gives us that classic cobblestone appearance. And what is the cobblestone appearance? It's a mix of hypochoic or anechoic fluid between the hyperechoic fat or connect, uh, connective tissue. You should always be doing a contralateral comparison. It just takes one quick scan just to compare it to the opposite side. And with cellulitis, because it's an, an, an inflammatory finding, really, we need to, or a bacterial infection itself, we need to identify maybe what's the underlying cause. So always be thinking outside the box. Is the patient a cancer patient or is there underlying deep vein thrombosis? Look, typically they're identified pretty easily on ultrasound. They very rarely would get to MRI. Uh, the treatment for cellulitis is typically antibiotics, and that's either oral or IV. Johnny, is there anything you'd like to add to cellulitis? No, just lots of gel, and if you need to use a standoff, use it because it does hurt them. Yeah. Okay, defend thrombosis. Very quickly, a very, very brief introduction. Uh, know your anatomy. You can have a look at the slides in, in later on, so upper limb and lower limb. This is the example of, um, we'll say, compression is key. So we should be always doing our compressions in transverse orientation. You can imagine if this is the lumen of the vein in the very left-hand side of the image and we apply pressure down, the veins will collapse in the absence of any thrombus and we get that kind of winking vein just like we see on the right hand side of the image. Now, if we pop in some thrombus uh, into the lumen of the vein, uh, the vein itself won't compress. And what we see is we won't get that winking of the vein itself. So I popped in DVTs because sometimes the patient can actually pre uh, present with, they feel that they might have a firm lump in their calf or even in their uh, upper thigh. Uh, when you scan the region of interest, everything might look normal. Don't outrule the vascular structures itself. Maybe you might see something in there. Um, it's not a case of a defensive medicine, but you have to really try to look around the, the area. It's not a case of just pop your ultrasound transducer, point of care and say, no, everything is fine. Clinical presentations for deep vein thrombosis is localized pain, limb heaviness and cramps, swelling, limb discoloration, focal lump. And the patient should always have a laboratory results of D-dimers uh, which are uh, fibrin lysis breakdown in the blood that uh, is seen at uh, times where there is most likely to be some form of a deep vein thrombosis. The well score, which is a criteria uh, scoring uh, system for identifying those patients most likely to develop a uh, DVT. Uh, anything greater than two means that there is a high chance of that patient having a deep vein thrombosis. What are the sonographic appearances? Well, they are within the lumen of the vein, so it's within a vein. Uh, if it's fresh thrombus, it's typically hypoechoic, and they're quite difficult to identify fresh thrombus. Uh, it might be minimally invasive, echogenic, partially compression, and the overall vein diameter is somewhat dilated. If it's an old thrombus, so if it's a thrombus sitting there for quite a while, the thrombus itself is more mature within the lumen of the vein, so it's a hyperechoic, it means it's more echogenic, uh, it's non-compressible, so you can't apply your pressure, uh, it's avascular, it adheres to the wall, it's sticking to the wall, and, and the vein diameter actually um, um, reduces. Again, we should be using Doppler and we should be using spectral analysis. Patient management, uh, if, CT, if ultrasound is inconclusive, the patient might be referred on for a CT or an MRI treatment. If you identify a deep end thrombosis uh, or a DVT or a superficial thrombophobitis, which is a clot within the superficial system, you need to get that patient to the hospital. They need to be referred maybe to the emergency department. They need to go on anticoagulants. They might even, if it's serious, have to go for an IVC filter. Um, and in worst case scenarios, um, catheter directed uh, thrombolysis or even uh, surgical removal of um, thrombectomy. Johnny, is there anything you'd like to add on deep vein thrombosis? Yeah, just if you don't see one in the lower calf, keep keep looking for a cause of a, a swollen calf. And then if you do see it, of course, look how far centrally does it propagate up into the um, into the femoral and common femoral and in, into the pelvic as well. And always try and have a look at the IVC if it's going up that far. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, moving on is paget scroter syndrome. Uh, paget scroter syndrome is maybe some something that um, a lot of us might not have heard of but it's actually quite um, prevalent. paget scroter syndrome is a self-induced deep vein thrombosis of the upper limb. So how does the patient actually present? 
it's a peer after a period of exercise or oc occupation related. So it's a self-induced deep end thrombosis to the subclavian vein. If you have a look at the right hand side, the top right hand side of uh, your screen, the schematic diagram, uh, what you actually can see is the uh, that type space that type tight space between the clavicle and the underlying first rib and um, the surrounding muscle architecture around the area. And at a period of when the patient is doing a strenuous activity, they build up their muscles that actually pinches the subclavian vein. And when they actually go back and do more exercise, um, they'll stretch the overlying uh, subclavian vein itself, uh, causing maybe a micro trauma tear uh, to the inner lining of the vessel itself. And with that, we get scarring and with more exercise or normal daily activities, uh, it ends up becoming a, a, a larger tear, a coagulation cascade, and as a result, the formation of a trauma within. So how do our patients actually present? Well, typically they might be in the absence of any trauma, young patients uh, who are active gym goers, um, or if it's occupation related, it might be those that are uh, painters that are doing a strenuous activity um, at that area, that might be pinching uh, the subclavian vein, or else uh, waiters, waitresses that are carrying around high loads um, uh, at that period over throughout the day. The patients themselves will have a firm pain at the supraclavicular area itself. They will be unable to lift their arm above their head. The patient will have a numb arm. Look at the patient, they'll have a swelling, they'll have a blue discoloration. There'll be in, uh, no history of trauma. The patient most likely won't be on any form of medication unless if it's a female, they might be on an oral contraceptive pill. Um, and also look at the chest of the patient themselves. They might have these collaterals, uh, tributaries, a venous webbing on the chest because uh, they just want the, the blood just wants to get around that clot itself. So what are the ultrasound appearances of Paget's growth or syndrome itself? Um, typically, it's echogenic thrombus in the subclavian vein. It's distorted venous flow. Uh, you might see a roulette formation, which suggests sluggish flow um, within the lumen of the vein. You need to use augmentation. You need to induce flow within the lumen of the vein. Um, you might look at the vein caliber. So you might identify and say, well, there's no thrombus within the lumen of the vein, but look at the caliber of the vein. It's quite large. Why did we put this in here for lumps and bumps? A lot of time you might get referrals for a query biceps tendon tear and the patient might present like this. And it just doesn't uh, add up sometimes. Um, treatment uh, is typically if ultrasound is inconclusive, the patient needs to go on for a CT uh, with contrast or MRI, or maybe even into the interventional suite for a venogram. Now, the treatment is quite um, important here because if it's uh, less than 14 days, uh, it's typically they might go on some form of anticoagulants. Um, sorry, if it's greater than 14 days, then they go on for a surgical uh, rib resection, or it might be even some form of a thrombolysis itself. So treatment is quite important. Um, if it's not identified pretty quickly, it can have severe implications on the patients themselves. So Johnny, is there anything you'd like to add on? Um, no, Kevin, other than, other than this is very real, and we're seeing more and more uh, presentations of this in both young boys and young girls. When I yeah. say that, the, the gym goers, who are really hypertrophying that um, anterior scalene muscle. Yeah, totally. Okay, Martin's neuroma um, is clinical presentation, four foot pain radiating from the midfoot to the toes, symptoms worse than with activity, localized swelling. Uh, the patients might present with, they'll say that they have some form of a pebble or a burning sensation within uh, their foot. The sonographic appearances, if you look at it, um, uh, particularly on the bottom right hand side of your screen, the second uh, ultrasound image, uh, but typically occur between the third and fourth uh, web space, at the third web space between the third and fourth metatarsal heads, usually always proximate to the metatarsal head itself. They're typically this rounded, ovoid, hypochoic avascular mass. And you should always be trying to identify the modular sign itself. If you're not familiar with it, uh, go off and study it and learn it. But typically it's with applied transducer pressure. Uh, in one hand, what you see is the neuroma itself will move towards the plantar surface. So it actually moves and it um, correlates the patient's uh, symptoms. Patient management, if ultrasound is inconclusive, it's typically on for an MRI. Um, and the treatment is uh, usually maybe injections of steroid and local anesthetic or even surgical excision. Johnny, is there anything you'd like to add to Martin's neuromas? 
No, other than that, um, it, that little maneuver of putting your thumb into the interspace and actually pushing down onto your probe, keeping your probe um, um, steady, and then I flip it over and go from the planter and push um, dorsally. Yeah, yeah. Okay, schwannoma, uh, staying on nerves again, is a benign peripheral uh, nerve tumour again. It's a focal lump, painful mass. Uh, um, if there is nerve dysfunction itself, it's non-mobile. Uh, the ultrasound appearances are typically ovoid or hypoechoic, heterogeneous. What you might see is posterior acoustic enhancement. Um, there might be some form of vascularity associated with them. And typically, just try to identify in longitudinal orientation the nice nerve itself, and then you'll identify the mass as well. So this is at a time where you need to have a good anatomical knowledge of these. So they're a benign peripheral nerve tumor coming off the nerve itself. Ultrasound, if it's inconclusive, the patient should be referred for an MRI. The treatment is typically an observation and imaging if it's asymptomatic. If it is symptomatic, the patient should be considered for surgery. Johnny, is there anything you'd like to add to uh, this? But you can see, Kevin, how they could be um, mistakenly diagnosed for a um, for a sarcoma, couldn't they? Yeah. Um, right. So we would go on and do a pre and post GAD, looking at the neurovascular bundle and the close relationship with it, and uh, there'd be no touch lesions. We wouldn't biopsy these. Yeah. Okay, inguinal hernias. Okay, so you could do a full talk on hernias itself, but then they're a common presentation. So the clinical presentation is a focal lump at the groin that can either be direct or indirect, um, pain more pronounced uh, with activity. So um, a direct hernia is a type of groin herniation that arises from the uh, protuberance of the uh, abdominal viscera to a weakness on the posterior uh, wall of the inguinal uh, canal itself, medial to the inferior epigastric uh, vessels, whereas the indirect uh, hernia uh, is more deeper uh, within the deep ring and it enters the inguinal canal itself. Having a look at it, you really need to identify your inguinal ligament. And what you will see then is maybe a breach in the inguinal ligament itself. You might see a hypochoic uh, neck, uh, a protuberance up through the canal itself, heterogeneous, ill-defined mass, exaggerated with valsava, pain on solid palpation. And a good little technique that I always get the patients to do is if they're lying somewhat supine, just try to ask them to do a shoulder tilt, and then you might just see the protuberance, as you see in the middle image, uh, through the breach of the inguinal ligament itself. Uh, if ultrasound is inconclusive, the patient might be referred on for an MRI. And again, the treatment is typically, uh, if they're large, uh, they might be uh, referred on for laparoscopic surgery with a mesh, plate, uh, mesh placement or an open repair. Johnny, is there anything you'd like to add to inguinal ligaments? Kev, other than to say, I always stand them up at the end. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay, pseudoaneurysms uh, is also known as a false aneurysm. So it's a painful focal mass, um, typically, um, I didn't, I've seen on the, where the radial artery arises. It's typically from an, an iatrogenic uh, procedure. So typically something that might be in the cat lab for a stentin placement, a coronary stentin. So typically where you might see these present is from radial or femoral axis. Also know your population because uh, sometimes they might present in intravenous drug abusers themselves. Uh, so as you can see in the top left hand side of your, uh, the top left image itself, you can mistake it for a ganglion cyst by just looking at it, but if you take a good history and you know the kind of activities the patient has had in the last couple of weeks, you might most likely be able to say, well, this is a pseudoranism rather than a ganglion cyst itself. The ultrasound appearances are totally different to a ganglion cyst. B mode, it's an anechoic cystic structure. That's what's somewhat similar, but you might see the formation of thrombus within, or as you can see in the top right hand side of your screen, you'll see the act of flow of blood from the underlying artery into the sac-like structure itself. Color is what really gives it away. It gives us that yin-yang or Pepsi sign. So the swirling motion, blood flowing into the sac and flowing back out into the underlying artery itself. But really what gives it away is the spectral analysis, the to and fro waveform. So the to and fro waveform should always be taken at the neck. So the, feet, the neck that feeds from the underlying artery into the sac-like structure. And on your waveform, what you'll see is a to and fro waveform. So to means above the baseline flowing into the sac, and fro means below the baseline flowing out of the sac itself. 
The treatment is uh, typically um, a conservative. If they're quite small, let it be. It might be a compression where they try to uh, obliterate uh, blood flow from the, with the transducer uh, at the neck of the pseudoaneurysm itself. Uh, in increments of 15 minutes of compression and pop it off and uh, light touch it in and see if there any flow into the pseudoaneurysms. Uh, some of the latest research as well, which say that uh, thrombin injection or collagen injection are the treatments for uh, pseudoaneurysms themselves on sound guided um, guidance. So this is something definitely uh, that Johnny is well aware of. Johnny, is there anything you'd like to add to pseudoaneurysms? No, Kev, it's a beautiful demonstration there, but Kev, um, when we were little, we used to have to go and hold these in the cath lab for hours yeah. to try and close them up. Now with the thrombin, it's really dramatic. It's a, we get magnificent results just instantaneously. Yeah, great. Uh, we're there. Okay, so this, I think, is our last lump and bump. Uh, yep. but we just have one or two slides. And uh, this is an epididymal head cyst. So why did I add it in? Well, a lot of your patients might actually present and they'll say that they were in the shower and that they feel a lump in their groin. Uh, but it's actually really a epididymal head cyst. So it's on the outer surface or on the epididymis itself, which uh, outline, is the, on the outline of the testes itself. So the clinical presentation, the patient will say a focal lump at the groin, notice that maybe typically in the shower, no pain, not really. They, they would be concerned because when uh, male patients identify a lump at the groin, they're somewhat concerned. A typical rule of thumb is generally Anything that is within the testes, um, if we see a lesion or a mass, we're definitely worried. Anything we see on the outside of it, to an extent, is most likely to be uh, benign. So intratesticular, malignant, extratesticular, uh, somewhat benign. So you're thinking cystic structures or epididymitis or an inflammation. Uh, ultrasound appearances of an epididymal head cyst is an anechoic cystic mass. There might be septations within. It's always at the epididymal head. They're avascular, they're non-mobile, they have posterior acoustic enhancement, they're encapsulated, they're thin-walled. Uh, typical treatments are they're typically left alone. Um, if they have a dragging sensation, if they're quite large, if they're uncomfortable, if they're causing symptoms, there might be some form of a surgical excision, but it's quite, quite rare. Um, so that's all the lumps and bumps. I have two or three more slides. Uh, Johnny, how are you for time? Do you want to still stay No, on? that's good, just on that, and you, you stressed it, Kev, really, really try hard. And particularly in the face of a complex epididymal cyst, sometimes it can be difficult to know, is that intraaxial or extraaxial to the um, to the testis? It's so important because mm -hmm. if that's intraaxial to the testis, it's a whole different ball game. Yeah, totally. Okay, let's have a look at some of the literature. I've really only picked two papers that are quite uh, interesting and they're really kind of identified um on Facebook and on Twitter in the forum groups. The first one is from this paper here, and it's uh, from um, Orlando, and it's a, a bump, what to do next, ultrasound imaging of soft tissue uh, palpated lesions. Now I've highlighted the main areas within this um, article or this manuscript, and the objective it says is the challenge of managing patients with a soft tissue mass is to avoid extensive studies and unnecessary surgery in large number of patients with benign abnormalities, while avoiding delayed diagnosis in the small number of patients with malignancy. It says MRI or ultrasound. So MRI is usually appropriate in cases of non-diagnostic initial ultrasound evaluation. And the goals of ultrasound imaging is to confirm the actual presence of the focal lesion to establish the precise features of the lesion, the location, the size, the structure, differentiate it from a solid or a cystic mass, identify if it's most likely to be a malignant or benign lesion, provide a definitive uh, diagnosis and help establish the best management for the patient itself. It talks about a systemic uh, um, approach itself. So it's good to talk. So again, all the things that we've discussed earlier on at the start of the webinar, how long has the lesion been there, the changes, the pain, the history, the surrounds and the age of the patient itself. And again, it goes into the technical aspect. So it's a really good paper you should read on the basics. It identifies the type of transducers. Don't always just rely on your linear transducer. If you have access to a hockey stick, which is a smaller uh, footprint, but really good for the superficial structures itself, great resolution. It might identify the lesion in better detail itself. If the lesion is somewhat deep and you can't penetrate it, swap over to your curvilinear. And then it talks about your frequency, your gain, your depth, 
So your right hand should be scanning. Your left hand should be dancing. You should be manipulating the probe itself. Set your focal region at the region of interest. As Johnny said, gel standoff is very, very important for these lumps and bumps. Because if you apply pressure as a normal, if you're looking at a muscle, you might obscure the near field. You might obscure the um, super, superficial layer of the bump itself. It might have some really important detail that we really need to see on that resultant uh, ultrasound image itself. Your field of view, open up your field of view, get panoramic images. If you're unsure, take cine loops, which are like video recordings of the ultrasound image itself. The patient uh, uh, position is quite important. As Johnny said, sometimes he gets his patients to stand up for ingoing um, hernias or ligament evaluation. If it's a case of it's a lump or bump on the back, uh, we've often done it. Johnny's often taught me, um, get the patient to stand up, get the patient to bend over. It will pronounce that lump or bump better. Uh, dynamic evaluation, how does uh, it correspond to the movement? Is it plantar flexion, plantar extension? What impact has it on the joint? Remember, when you're looking at it in transverse orientation, you should always be taking two measurements and one in long. And if you're really unsure, always do a contralateral comparison. It goes into the basics of identifying B mode only detects the lesion itself, but color and spectral Doppler confirm and establishes it. And that's really important because if you popped on your ultrasound transducer on your, uh, we'll say, radial aspect of the wrist and it was just an anechoic cystic structure, you might call it a ganglion cyst, but it could have been a pseudoaneurysm, a radial pseudoaneurysm. But by applying color and spectral analysis, uh, we can really move it into a different category and it's totally different um, uh, man uh, patient management for the patient themselves. And to conclude, it just has a little uh, sheet, a crib sheet that says benign. They're typically small, they're typically soft, they're typically superficial, they're typically homogenous and avascular. Whereas if they're malignant, typically malignant lesions pop up in patients, but not always, not always in patients that are greater than 50 years of age. Previous history of malignancy, if they're deep, if the lesion itself is greater than five, taller than wide is a really common one. So if the lesion is actually taller than it is wide, and um, there's a high probability that this um, lesion or mass could be malignant. If it infiltrates the surrounding areas, if it's got vascularity and fast growing. And finally, to conclude, this is another paper you should really be using uh, or reading. It's called Ultrasonography of Superficial Soft Tissue Masses. And it's, it's um, a paper uh, written by John Jacobson, who's a wonderful MSK radiologist. And it identifies really a crib sheet that what you should be really ticking off as you're looking at this and that may, should be really going into your report. So that's um, everything. Johnny, is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, that's great, um, Kev. Just, um, you know what I'm like, I'm anal on the split screen. So you said, look at the contralateral limb. So I'll split the screen and try to show the normal, the abnormal, because um, uh, to our referring clinicians, it's also educational, not only for the patient, because they can actually see the difference, but also for our, um, our referring clinicians, particularly the general practitioners. Yeah, so that's great. Well, that's um, unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> do, you want to, do you want to stop? Do you want to stop screen sharing, Kev? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, He's amazing. Yeah, he got through time. 26 lesions plus two articles in was, an, hour, an hour and 20. That was phenomenal, that was, uh, Kevin. Really wonderful, mate. Well done. Very proud of you. Absolutely, uh, absolutely epic session. Let me um, just um, tag some guys back in. Johnny, I'm just conscious that you you're you're right, mate. I'm watching the screen here. I've got no. I've just, I've just got. Um, X-rays, no, no CAT scans at this stage. Let yep. me just um, let me just bring uh, some of the guys back on. Um, I'm just conscious. Yeah, just want to get through some questions if we can. I know it's yeah. time to get on a bit, guys. But to be fair, there's still 80 people or so on the call, so True. everyone everyone was loving it. <laughs> I'll just say if there if there's any specific questions and people are afraid that um, I I think at the very end of my slide there, if people want to email me at Kevin Cronin K E V I N K-E-V-I-N dot Cronin, C-R-O-N-I-N at UCD.ie. Uh, I'll get back to them tomorrow. Or if they want uh, on Twitter, uh, at Cronin90, Kevin, is, um, I can get back to them there as well if they want to DM me. Fantastic. Um, I, I've got a question straight away off the back. I mean, there's a few, um, there's, a, there's quite a few questions. I want to ask one just which I think is really important. So on this call tonight, we've got probably a real spectrum of people working in all sorts of different environments. So we've got guys working in point of care. So orthopedics, physio, podiatry, rheumatology, 
work in NHS environments, work in private uh, clinic environments as well. And we all know that as soon as you put an ultrasound probe on, you can come across anything. Anything can pop up on, pop up on the screen. A question that I often get asked is, are there say three to five top signs that we should look for when we come across a lesion that's a, size, a sign for concern? Or is it that actually anything that we come across that is a lump or a bump that is not something within our routine scope we should be sending on to Johnny or Kevin? <laughs> yeah. Um, I suppose um, I, uh, for me anyway, um, some of the things that I'd be thinking of is um uh the size of it uh, so if it's uh, if it's uh, less than five centimeters um looking at uh, if it's well encapsulated um so something that's aggressive uh, is typically not uh, well encapsulated um vascularity for me as well would be another one uh, so, um more often than not benign uh, masses themselves are avascular um, and i guess i guess one issue sorry to interrupt you kevin one issue with that as well is is that We've got to understand our machines, haven't we? The capabilities yeah. of the machine that we're using. You know, not everyone's using um, some of these high spec machines that some of us are using in radiology, and so we've got to understand the sensitivities of our Doppler. You know, if you, if you if you're working in the point of care setting and you're using the machine and you've got a Doppler system that perhaps isn't that sensitive, then again, I think the message is, is you know, don't rely on the fact that there isn't any vascularity. Yeah. yeah. Totally. So that's for me, it's the size um, um, it's also looking at the vascularity and it's looking at its boundary. Is it well encapsulated or not? Or is it a kind of a lesion that's saying, you know what, I'm going to invade my neighbours here. Yeah, yeah. And and I'd also say even before you touch the probe, um, is it hard and is it fixed? Yeah. And they're, they're two real red flags to me. Yeah. Uh, the capsule is, is true, but um, we know that sarcomas can be well encapsulated, um, and with that real that firmness, that in, inability to compress, and um, any signs of uh, insinuation or infiltration is um, immediate red flag. Yeah, for me, when I went in training under Johnny, um, it opened up my eyes to the consultation with the patient, and really that kind of forms nearly my first two or three lines of my report because. I'm in the room scanning. Johnny's probably reporting on MRIs next door. He doesn't see these patients, but he might need to know that information before he can actually put his conclusion on that. So, uh, you know, on, like on consultation with the patient, and he might pick something out of that that says, you know what, I think he might need to refer this patient for an MRI or I'm not too happy, or why didn't you do this with this scan? Yeah, I mean, if um, my Kev, we always scan together, didn't we? But um, if I'm if I'm remote, uh, you know, you really, really got to love and trust your sonographer, and um, that history is so important. And those little jewels that they might put in the history, my goodness, that turns us away from being non-aggressive to aggressive, or vice versa. So, so important that history and examination. Yeah. Rob, Dave, did you have any particular questions before I sort of? Pick a couple out of the um, the thread. Oh, I think you're on a uh, mute, Dave. No, to, to be honest with you, Stu, yeah, I mean, that's, I guess, you know, as somebody who works almost entirely in sort of private practice now, I think that the, the money, you know, the, the I guess the take homes really, and, and thanks, uh, Kevin and Johnny. Uh, fantastic presentation. I've, I've learned so much in a hour in, in a long time. <laughs> I'm going to have to watch it back over a few times. So um, have I, Dave. So have I, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but that was really, really very well presented. So thank you for that. But um, yeah, I, and, and I think, I think to be honest with you, I think Stu just nailed it. And that is, you know, we're working away. If we don't have that same radiology support, we just want to, you know, try to be safe for us and obviously for our patients. And so it's that what how can we be of most use to our patients in terms of if we see something, we flagging them up and just those cardinal signs. We don't want to be alarmist, but also we want to make sure that if we see anything that or come across anything, we get them to the right place as quickly as possible. So I think those 
points on those last few slides and those points that you just made then were fantastic. I don't know if there's anything else you mentioned with the history. I think you sort of said at the beginning, you know, how long have you had the problem for and what sort of time frames might we be thinking of there, would you say are really important? Yeah, always just close your eyes and listen to that history because it's yeah. going to get you almost 70% of the way there. Examination is probably going to give you another 15% um, with your hands and now the magic of ultrasound. Will, um, will give you the last 10 to 15%. The other thing is, Dave, um, and I know a lot of a lot of us are working in isolated um, uh, contexts, um, try and uh, incorporate, incorporate yourself into an MDT, a multidisciplinary team, um, and, and also a multi-modality multidisciplinary team so that you do know what this lump looks like on MRI pre and post GAD, what would we be looking for on a, on a T1 uh, image, et cetera, or a STIR image. So try and get that multimodality feel and know what the limitations of ultrasound are. Let's, we can't be heroes with the small focus ultrasounds, which are fantastic. And I think they're going to change the face of diagnostics in the next 10 years, the little butterflies, et cetera. But um, you know, they do have limitations, um, know those limitations and know when it's time to say, you know what, we think this is an aggressive lesion to prove otherwise we need to go to X or Y. Yeah. And build a, build a really good network where um, you've just, there's no shame in ringing uh, you know, a consultant, getting more information or asking them for their guidance. I think, I think that's brilliant, brilliant points there, Johnny. I mean, one of the things that we always bang the drum about is the, is the issue around clinical governance. And, and yeah, okay, it's a bit of a dry topic, but when it comes to ultrasound, you know, when you're using ultrasound in point of care environments or wherever, you know, you've got to have your governance in check because at some point, sooner or later, you'll come across something, yeah. you know, somebody will come in with a, oh, I've got a bit of pain in my, my quad. Is it, a, is it a sports injury? And, you know, th you know sometimes these come in and they're, they're sarcomas or whatever. So, you know, you've got to have your governance in place. You've got to have your pathways established be very yes. clear on the scope of how you're using things yeah and be forever learning you know yeah. like you know, the pearls that i've just learned from kev and you know what kev taught me around about the hamstring is just something very very special you could do a whole hour on that and it's a yeah. thing of beauty really, is I'm gonna, johnny uh, stewart taught me everything so <laughs> Not at all. I'm now, for those I'm, who are interested kevin's kicking off at 11 p.m tonight going through to 1 a.m oh, no, no. i'm going to bed um, although I'm conscious of time, guys, and, and, um, and stuff. So let me just pick a couple of questions out of, out of the list. Um, uh, is a parameniscal cyst always associated with a meniscal tear? Uh, Stoller will say yes to that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. 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 A ruptured yep. Baker's cyst, if left alone, would they eventually disappear? They can. They can, but the majority in my experience will um, uh, reoccur. Yep. Um, could you clarify on sarcoma, posterior shadowing or enhancement? Can be mixed. Can, Can be, be mixed. Yeah. yeah. That's what I thought. Um, uh, is vascularity within a lipoma a worrying feature? Would you always MRI an intramuscular lipoma? I saw that. Um, so just the first question, if there's vascularity in a lipoma, um, I'd look at the... the um, the architecture of that vascularity is it is it chaotic or is it just um, vessels passing through? Um, but if there was chaotic, that would elevate my level of concern, and I'd go on to a pre and post GAD. Yeah, and, 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 just, and, and just on that as well is uh, be careful as well. People might actually call it that it's vascularity, but it might be a movement artifact correct. from those, you know. So yeah. just be careful. And I think yeah. as a as a you know somebody who does work in radiology but doesn't do lumps and bumps lists routinely, I think what's really nice to see with you guys tonight is the terminology that you're using to describe lumps and bumps and how you've clearly got huge mileage and what you're reporting and what you're how you're concluding and what you're seeing and i think it just really shows hopefully to, to, to guys out there who are, who are doing ultrasound is that you know to, to call it a lump or a bump confidently takes a huge amount of mileage and expertise and using a high spec system so yeah just to, just to drop that in i think that's you just really sort of summarize a couple and, of nice and, it's, and it's really really positive thing for a general practitioner you know, because they're, you know, it's been a while since they've done their anatomy. They know it's a lump. They've got concern. But to be able to give them, um, you know, we'll never potentially be definitive but with ultrasound with some of these lesions that Kevin's shown tonight. You can be absolutely definitive, okay? And that's a that's a really positive finding for them in in terms of managing their patients yeah. and for the patient themselves. So they leave the room. I oh, the other thing is I always show them 
what their um, ganglia looks like uh, on Google. So I show them on the phone what it looks like. And you can just see there, they just have a breath out and they walk out knowing this isn't cancer. Mm -hmm. Super. I think what we'll do, we're going to try and wrap up there. I know, Johnny, you've got to crack on tonight. And um, But Kevin and Johnny, thank you to both of you. Uh, absolutely fantastic evening. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, it's been really, really interesting. And um, I think it shows up, throws up probably lots of different questions that we could keep talking about all night long. Um, but the fact that we've still got 50 to 60 people uh, whether it's at half nine on a Monday night is uh, is yeah. testament, I think, to the quality of what you presented, Kevin. So um, thank you so much um, to both of you for your expertise uh, in joining us. Guys, this is hopefully going to be recorded <laughs> uh, and I'll, I will share it um, in due course and, and obviously checking with Kevin joining it. They're happy with that later. Um, shameless plug, we do a number of different courses, predominantly in London around MSK ultrasound and guide injections. We've got some, and some advanced introductory courses coming up in November. We've got the PG cert course, which I've managed to twist uh, Kevin's arm now to get involved with as well, uh, delivering some lumps and bumps content on it as well. Um, we're looking to try and do more of these webinars coming up over the next um, few months. Uh, we really enjoy doing them. Um, so if people have particular topics that they want us to think about trying to present, um, please do reach out to, to me, drop me an email through the website or on social media. Um, I'm not too scary. Come and have a chat. And um, yeah, hopefully we can keep educating and keep chatting about ultrasound. Good on you, Stu. Well done. And Kevin, great Thank effort, mate. Thanks, Thanks guys. Just Thanks again, guys. Bye-bye. Good bye. Bye. night, everybody. God bless. Travel safe. Cheers, Cheers everyone. Bye. Thanks for having me. Thanks for including me, guys. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.